Analytical Chemistry 2.0 by David Harvey. Chapter 4. Section 4D. The Distribution of Measurements and Results. Earlier we reported results for a determination of the mass of a circulating United States penny, obtaining a mean of 3.117 grams, and a standard deviation of 0.051 grams. Table 4.11 shows results for a second, independent determination of a penny as mass, as well as the data from the first experiment. Although the means and standard deviations for the two experiments are similar, they are not identical. The difference between the experiments raises some interesting questions. Are the results for one experiment better than those for the other experiment? Do the two experiments provide equivalent estimates for the mean and the standard deviation? What is our best estimate of a penny as expected mass? To answer these questions we need to understand how to predict the properties of all pennies by analyzing a small sample of pennies. We begin by making a distinction between populations and samples. Section 4D.1 Populations and Samples A population is the set of all objects in the system we are investigating. For our experiment, the population is all the United States pennies in circulation. This population is so large that we cannot analyze every member of the population. Instead, we select and analyze a limited subset or sample of the population. The data in Table 4.11, for example, are results for two samples drawn from the larger population of all circulating United States pennies. Section 4D.2 Probability Distributions for Populations Table 4.11 provides the mean and standard deviation for two samples of circulating United States pennies. What do these samples tell us about the population of pennies? What is the largest possible mass for a penny? What is the smallest possible mass? Are all masses equally probable, or are some masses more common? To answer these questions we need to know something about how the masses of individual pennies are distributed around the population's average mass. We represent the distribution of a population by plotting the probability or frequency of obtaining and specific result as a function of the possible results. Such plots are called probability distributions. There are many possible probability distributions. In fact, the probability distribution can take any shape depending on the nature of the population. Fortunately, many chemical systems display one of several common probability distributions. Two of these distribution, the binomial distribution and the normal distribution, are discussed in this section. Binomial distribution. The binomial distribution describes a population in which the result is the number of times a particular event occurs during a fixed number of trials. Mathematically, the binomial distribution is the binomial distribution of x and n is equal to n factorial over x factorial times n minus x all factorial times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x where p x n is the probability that an event occurs x times during n trials, and p is the event's probability for a single trial. If you flip a coin five times, p, two, five, is the probability that the coin will turn up heads exactly twice. A binomial distribution has well-defined measures of central tendency and spread. The expected mean value is mu is equal to n times p, and the expected spread is given by the variance Sigma squared is equal to n times p multiplied by 1 minus p, or the standard deviation. Sigma is equal to the square root of n times p multiplied by 1 minus p. The binomial distribution describes a population whose members can take on only specific, discrete values. When you roll a die, for example, the possible values are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. A roll of 3.45 is not possible. As shown in example 4.10, one example of a chemical system obeying the binomial distribution is the probability of finding a particular isotope in a molecule. Normal distribution. A binomial distribution describes a population whose members have only certain discrete values. This is the case with the number of C13 atoms in cholesterol. A molecule of cholesterol, for example, can have two C13 atoms, but it cannot have 2.5 atoms of C13. A population is continuous, if its members may take on any value. 
The efficiency of extracting cholesterol from a sample, for example, can take on any value between 0%, no cholesterol extracted, and 100%, all cholesterol extracted. The most common continuous distribution is the Gaussian, or normal distribution, the equation for which is f of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared multiplied by e to the negative x minus mu all squared over 2 sigma squared where mu is the expected mean for a population with n members. Mu is equal to the sum of the xi over n and sigma squared is the population s variance. Sigma squared is equal to the sum of the xi minus mu all squared all divided by n. Examples of normal distributions, each with an expected mean of 0 and with variances of 25, 100, or 400, are shown in figure 4.7. Two features of these normal distribution curves deserve attention. First, note that each normal distribution has a single maximum corresponding to mu, and that the distribution is symmetrical about this value. Second, Increasing the population s variance increases the distribution s spread and decreases its height. The area under the curve, however, is the same for all three distribution. The area under a normal distribution curve is an important and useful property as it is equal to the probability of finding a member of the population with a particular range of values. In figure 4.7, for example, 99.99% of the population shown in curve a, have values of x between minus 20 and 20. For curve, c, 68.26% of the population s members have values of x between minus 20 and 20. Because a normal distribution depends solely on mu and sigma squared, the probability of finding a member of the population between any two limits is the same for all normally distributed populations. Figure 4.8 for example, shows that 68.26% of the members of a normal distribution have a value within the range mu plus or minus 1 sigma, and that 95.44% of population S members have values within the range mu plus or minus 2 sigma. Only 0.17% members of a population have values exceeding the expected mean by more than plus or minus 3 sigma. Additional ranges and probabilities are gathered together in a probability table that you will find in Appendix 3. As shown in Example 4.11, if we know the mean and standard deviation for a normally distributed population, then we can determine the percentage of the population between any defined limits. Section 4D.3 Confidence Intervals for Populations If we randomly select a single member from a population, what is its most likely value? This is an important question, and, in one form or another, it is at the heart of any analysis in which we wish to extrapolate from a sample to the sample s parent population. One of the most important features of a population s probability distribution is that it provides a way to answer this question. Figure 4.8 shows that for a normal distribution, 68.26% of the population s members are found within the range of mu plus or minus 1 sigma. Stating this another way, there is a 68.26% probability that the result for a single sample drawn from a normally distributed population is in the interval mu plus or minus 1 sigma. In general, if we select a single sample we expect its value, xi, to be in the range xi is equal to mu plus or minus z times sigma, where the value of z is how confident we are in assigning this range. Values reported in this fashion are called confidence intervals. Equation 4.9, for example, is the confidence interval for a single member of a population. Table 4.12 gives the confidence intervals for several values of z. For reasons we will discuss later in the chapter, a 95% confidence level is a common choice in analytical chemistry. Alternatively, we can express a confidence interval for the expected mean in terms of the population s standard deviation and the value of a single member drawn from the population. Mu is equal to xi plus or minus z times sigma. It is unusual to predict the population s expected mean from the analysis of a single sample. We can extend confidence intervals to include the mean of n samples drawn from a population of known sigma. The standard deviation of the mean, sigma, sub x median, which also is known as the standard error of the mean, is sigma, sub x medium is equal to sigma, 
over the square root of n, the confidence interval for the population s mean, therefore, is mu is equal to x bar plus or minus z times sigma over the square root of n. Section 4D.4 Probability distributions for samples. In working example 4.11, 4.14, we assumed that the amount of aspirin in analgesic tablets is normally distributed. Without analyzing every member of the population, how can we justify this assumption? In situations where we cannot study the whole population, or when we cannot predict the mathematical form of a population s probability distribution, we must deduce the distribution from a limited sampling of its members. Sample distributions and the central limit theorem. Let us return to the problem of determining a penny s mass to explore further the relationship between a population s distribution and the distribution of a sample drawn from that population. The two sets of data in table 4.11 are too small to provide a useful picture of a sample s distribution. To gain a better picture of the distribution of pennies we need a larger sample, such as that shown in table 4.13. The mean and the standard deviation for this sample of 100 pennies are 3.095 grams and 0.0346 grams, respectively, a histogram. Figure 4.10 is a useful way to examine the data in table 4.13. To create the histogram, we divide the sample into mass intervals and determine the percentage of pennies within each interval. Table 4.14. Note that the sample S mean is the midpoint of the histogram. Figure 4.10 also includes an ormal distribution curve for the population of pennies, assuming that the mean and variance for the sample provide appropriate estimates for the mean and variance of the population. Although the histogram is not perfectly symmetric, it provides a good approximation of the normal distribution curve, suggesting that the sample of 100 pennies is normally distributed. It is easy to imagine that the histogram will more closely approximate a normal distribution if we include additional pennies in our sample. We will not offer a formal proof that the sample of pennies in table 4.13 and the population of all circulating U.S. pennies are normally distributed. The evidence we have seen, however, strongly suggests that this is true. Although we cannot claim that the results for all analytical experiments are normally distributed, in most cases the data we collect in the laboratory are, in fact, drawn from a normally distributed population. According to the central limit theorem, when a system is subject to a variety of indeterminate errors, the results approximate a normal distribution. As the number of sources of indeterminate error increases, the results more closely approximate a normal distribution. The central limit theorem holds true, even if the individual sources of indeterminate error are not normally distributed. The chief limitation to the central limit theorem is that the sources of indeterminate error must be independent and of similar magnitude, so that no one source of error dominates the final distribution. An additional feature of the central limit theorem is that a distribution of means for samples drawn from a population with any distribution will closely approximate a normal distribution if the size of the samples is large enough. Figure 4.11 shows the distribution for two samples of 10,000 drawn from a uniform distribution in which every value between 0 and 1 occurs with an equal frequency. For samples of size n equals 1, the resulting distribution closely approximates the population s uniform distribution. The distribution of the means for samples of size n equals 10, however, closely approximate a normal distribution. Degrees of freedom in reading to this point, did you notice the differences between the equations for the standard deviation or variance of a population and the standard deviation or variance of a sample? If not, here are the two equations. Sigma squared is equal to the sum of the xi minus mu squared over n and s squared is equal to the sum of the xi minus x median squared over n minus 1. Both equations measure the variance around the mean, using mu for a population and x medium for a sample. Although the equations use different measures for the mean, the intention is the same for both the sample and the population. A more interesting difference is between the denominators of the two equations. In calculating the population s variance we divide the numerator by the population s size n. For the sample s variance we divide by n minus 1, where n is the size of the sample. Why do we make this distinction? 
a variance is the average squared deviation of individual results from the mean. In calculating an average, we divide by the number of independent measurements, also known as the degrees of freedom, contributing to the calculation. For the population S variance, the degrees of freedom is equal to the total number of members, N, in the population. In measuring every member of the population, we have complete information about the population. When calculating the sample S variance, however, we first replace mu with X median, which we also calculate from the same data. If there are n members in the sample, we can deduce the value of the nth member from the remaining n minus 1 members. For example, if n is equal to 5 and we know that the first four samples are 1, 2, 3, and 4, and that the mean is 3, then the fifth member of the sample must be x5 is equal to x medium times n minus x1 minus x2 minus x3 minus x4, which is equal to 3 times 5. Minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, which is equal to 5. Using n minus 1 in place of n, when calculating the sample s variance ensures that s squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. Section 4D.5 Confidence intervals for samples. Earlier we introduced the confidence interval as a way to report the most probable value for a population s mean mu. Mu is equal to x bar plus or minus z times sigma over the square root of n, where x bar is the mean for a sample of size n, and sigma is the population s standard deviation. For most analyses, we do not know the population s standard deviation. We can still calculate a confidence interval, however, if we make two modifications to equation 4.11. The first modification is straightforward. We replace the population s standard deviation sigma, with the sample s standard deviation, s. The second modification is less obvious. The values of z in table 4.12 are for a normal distribution, which is a function of sigma squared, not s squared. Although the sample s variance, s squared, provides an unbiased estimate for the population s variance, sigma squared, the value of s squared for any sample may differ significantly from sigma squared. To account for the uncertainty in estimating sigma squared, we replace the variable z in equation 4.11 with the variable t, where t is defined such that t is greater than or equal to z at all confidence levels. Mu is equal to x bar plus or minus t times s over the square root of n. Values for t at the 95% confidence level are shown in table 4.15. Note that t becomes smaller as the number of degrees of freedom increases. Approaching Z as N approaches infinity. The larger the sample, the more closely its confidence interval approaches the confidence interval given by equation 4.11. Appendix 4 provides additional values of T for other confidence levels. Section 4D.6 A cautionary statement. There is a temptation, when analyzing data to plug numbers into an equation, carry out the calculation, and report the result. This is never a good idea and you should develop the habit of constantly reviewing and evaluating your data. For example, if an analysis on five samples gives an analyte s mean concentration as 0.67 ppm with a standard deviation of 0.64 ppm, then the 95% confidence interval is mu is equal to 0.67 ppm plus or minus 2.776 times 0.64 ppm over the square root of 5 which is equal to 0.67 plus or minus 0.79 ppm. This confidence interval suggests that the analyte S true concentration lies within the range of negative 0.12 to 1.46 ppm. Including a negative concentration within the confidence interval should lead you to re-evaluate your data or conclusions. A closer examination of your data may convince you that the standard deviation is larger than expected making the confidence interval too broad, or you may conclude that the analyte S concentration is too small to detect accurately. Here is a second example of why you should closely examine your data. The results for samples drawn from a normally distributed population must be random. If the results for a sequence of samples show a regular pattern or trend, then the underlying population may not be normally distributed, or there may be a time-dependent determinant error. For example, if we randomly select 20 penis and find 
that the mass of each penny is larger than that for the preceding penny, we might suspect that our balance is drifting out of calibration.